Hi, you're listening to Cool Story with Bree and Bridie. My name's Bree Lee. Unfortunately, Bridie is sick as a dog this week. She has that thing a lot of us have where she's lost her voice the first week of holidays and she is now on long service leave. The good news is that we had just recorded a special episode where we trialed some fun new formats. So what you're about to listen to is Bridie and I arriving at the studio with three questions to ask each other that we had not disclosed to each other before we started recording. As you can imagine, it is equal parts unhinged and profound. Then we set each other the challenge of arriving with the book or books that had most kicked us in the guts. Not even that we'd read just recently, but the books that we had read in our entire lives that stayed with us, got a hold of us and never left us. We also realized while we were recording this special episode that there was some real magic in asking each other these questions. And so we thought we would give you the opportunity to ask us some questions. Is there something you have always wanted to know about Bridie? Does she have a favorite child? Which tattoo does she actually regret the most? What about me? How did I get my book deals? Is there something I wish I'd done differently in my 20s? Nothing is off limits. If you've got a question, you can record it as a voice memo and DM us on our Instagram page at Cool Story Bree Bridie, or you can type it out or also attach it as a voice memo in an email. Our email address is coolstorybreebridie at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear your questions and answer them, and I think Bridie will bring her trademark exceptional transparency. <laughs> so enjoy this special episode of Cool Story with Bree and Bridie. I'm really excited for this. Number one is if you could commit any crime and get away with it, what would it be and why? One crime. How good is that? Oh, my God, so many things just flash through right? right? You can pick one, get away with it for life. No questions I'm asked. not going to murder anyone. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not right. No. You've got one crime. Go, I know, I know, go but, hard. Yeah, but it's also it's like your personal morals as well. And uh, it, I don't know. Yeah, that's not and so I can't. No, no, I know that I can't murder anyone. Oh, I can. No, my crime that I'm committing and getting away with. I know. Actually, I knew immediately what it is. It's some kind of mass scale robbery. Would you like for, for, might, your, for like r- would you Robin Hood the one percent somehow? Absolutely, that- yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. Like I'm taking a lot of money, probably not even from an individual. I probably want to go really, really, really big yeah. and take it from like a big company. Not Do even it, like with not s- even a bank because then ordinary people could end up being affected if they've got their money in it. But some giant private equity firm, exactly. Like, yeah, yes, yes. I'm going to figure out what private equity is, and then I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> And then I'm going to rob it hardcore, like take so much money, like billions. Yeah, That's trillions. My, and then I'm going to have a sick one. <laughs> <laughs> my guiding life philosophy. Having a sick one. Having a sick one. Yeah, and I would redistribute it. Yes. Is that a boring answer? No, I like that. That's more ex- That's more. Um, like can I be in your Ocean's 8 crew when you do that? Like you're going to come to me and I'm like, I'll be like, I've been out of this game a long time. <laughs> and then you say something and I go, son of a bitch, I'm in. <laughs> you've, you've taken up smoking just to be yeah. in the Ocean 8 crew. Re-taken up yeah, smoking. Yeah, <laughs> re-taken up smoking. We're all taking up smoking, smoking again. again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in this fantasy. That's right. There's yeah. only one person at the moment I could think that I would murder, but I wouldn't actually end up murdering them because I know that they've got people who love them. And I'm a real bleeding oh, heart. I'm sorry, Who? I've got, I can't say who it is, but I've got a real what? bleeding heart that way. If someone is loved by others, I couldn't be the one to take them away. What's your crime? I would assassinate Xi Jinping by dropping him out of a hot air balloon into a, like, Winnie the Pooh amusement park ride. <laughs> I love the method. Yeah. And it's like, so- there has to, he is, like, an authoritarian dictator who does most atrocious things. But don't you think... And he would be so... Like he has this absolute complex in his head about loathing Winnie the Pooh because there was like a joke made a very long time ago that he sort of looked like 
This is like an internet, famous internet meme that's joke right. that he Winnie, looks like Winnie the Pooh. And that's right. And Winnie the Pooh is like banned and in now China. Now it's banned in China yeah, because that's he's right. so self-conscious about it. And so not only do I want to get rid of him so that his country can flourish better without, and the people in his nation can flourish better without his horrific dictatorship. But don't, aren't you worried about another authoritative dictator just stepping into the breach? I've already thought about this. Okay. I still... You're going to take over. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I am com- like I'm confident that it couldn't be any worse than what he has like built with him at the top. Okay. Yeah, and That's it just needs one. to it needs to humiliate him for life. I love the humiliation aspect of it. It's particularly yeah. ruthless. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm also, yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> when was the last time you drank too much? I didn't get, para- we call it paralytically, like f- fucked up vomiting for hours and hours drunk. But um, I knew I had to have a meeting. I had this late, was it late lunch, early dinner meeting with my agent and my publisher to get some final round feedback on my next book, my novel. And that kind of thing makes me super anxious. So I don't, like I have decided for myself that there are basically only five people in the world whose opinions I value on my writing in progress. And two of those people are my agent and my publisher. And so because I just like don't read any other reviews and don't care about what anyone else says, because I'm trying to sort of protect myself from the huge amount of noise that can come and criticism that's not coming from the right place. Um, It means that how much kind of like emotional and intellectual weight those five opinions have is like hugely outsized. And so I was having this meeting and I was so nervous. I got way too drunk and then sort of couldn't remember what they'd actually told me needed fixing about Oh, my God. (laughs) What were you drinking? <laughs> I am a martini, a gin, dry gin martini person. Uh, but then we ate and so there was wine and then we were talking and so there was like digestive. So what did like, you do about getting your feedback? Uh, I just uh, very professionally asked for a follow-up in writing. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my professional reputation precedes me such that I could, I basically framed it like, just want to make sure I don't miss a single thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I woke up the next day and I was like, that was, could have played that better. That was not the most strategic, but I just, yeah. It's good when you're so reliable and so competent and such a professional that when you do mess something up, you can cover it. Yeah. A bit vaguely, yeah. Like that I'd use that tactic occasionally as well. Can you just put that in writing, or yeah. can you just refresh when actually yeah. I like vagued out, or you know, for whatever reason, yeah, wasn't listening. <laughs> yeah. All right. When was the last time you got mine? So much more bogan than yours. It was when the Cowboys beat the Tigers seventy four nil. I don't even know what sport that is. <laughs> I know it's kicking a ball. I don't know what shape the ball is, or if you can touch it. It's NRL. Okay. Great sport, footy, love footy, and it was like a really emotional win. I'm a Cowboys supporter my because fa- of my husband, brought to the Cowboys by my husband. And they had been flogged at Leichhardt by Tigers in May and my husband and I and my brother watched it live and it was like they flogged us so much it was like 68, 68 something, I forget. I, I've blocked out of my memory what our score was. It was like eight or something. And it they flogged us so badly. Like that is a very unusual score, score in NRL, number one. Number two, the Tigers are not a good team. So it's like particularly humiliating to be beat so badly by them. Three, we were watching it live at their home oval and obviously there's not a lot of Cowboys supporters around because we're in Sydney and that's a North Queensland team. And it got to the point where they were cheering the scoreboard being changed. That's how bad the defeat was. And then so that happened and then they played Tigers and it was in Townsville, so we watched it on TV, and we beat them 74-0, which is just insane. So me and um, my husband, like we just had too many beers, me and my friends and my husband watching. But this is one of the things that I love about sport and I, I love cricket as well. I love the psychology of it because that is not just who is better skilled players. This is what should interest you. For the Tigers to beat the Cowboys by that much a month ago 
and then the Cowboys to turn around and beat the Tigers by that much. Mm. That's not just pure skill, who's a better at passing a ball or kicking a ball or catching a ball. So much of those wins and losses are psychology. Yeah. Where they are mentally in there. And that always fascinates me. And I know that like on a just a personal level from like being a low level runner or even going to the gym. Like yeah. The, like whether I can run 5Ks or 15Ks is purely up here yeah. on any given day. And so anyway, that that's when I – and I was hungover the next day and the kids – Kids were loving it because the adults were having a great time. My husband, like, played the Cowboys song, which he never, ever does. He was so happy. <laughs> well, I told my husband I will go to any and all sports happily with him if it's women playing. I have a really great time at live sporting events. <laughs> oh, my God. I have a very excellent time at live sporting at live, events. I, I, loved, I love to watch sport. I love live. to sport watch the atmosphere, observe, a lot, the lot, atmosphere at a lot of women's games is great. It's particularly incredible. Now. But I also love the men's football and the men's ashes. You know, I get so much. I still get so much more into the men's ashes than I get into the women's ashes. Why? How can you possibly justify that opinion? Because just because I've been following them so much longer. Oh, like you haven't invested the players. In the team. Like I know yeah, who okay. the players are. Yeah, so because yeah, yeah. I think that's what the barrier. Like I want. I can't really justify it, and I I will get into the women's ashes. But I know it's so much easier for me to be more passionate about the men's ashes because I've been watching those men play for so much yeah. longer. Like some of the men on those team on the teams I've been watching like almost ten years. And so yeah. it's just All that right. little switch. Yeah. But the atmosphere, that kind of stuff is always great. So yes, thank you for scolding me about me <laughs> watching men. <laughs> I will turn on the women's ashes. There's like something that just grinds my fucking gears. Yeah, it's not about it's not about skill or anything. It's it's no no no. Yeah. Or about, I was just going to say yeah. that, like, if the thought of my admission ticket paying for something that, like, only goes to men and makes an effort historically to exclude women, I just like can't. I'm not a fun time gal. <laughs> if my entry fee is exacerbating inequality, <laughs> what is something you're really scared of, and it can't be something boring like someone you love dying? Okay. <laughs> So I would like childbirth, really boring. That's a boring. No, that's not boring. Okay. That's a great answer. That's as soon as you said that, that was bang. Really the first thing that came, Terrified. why are you scared of childbirth? What do you mean why am I scared of childbirth? It is the single highest risk activity any human being alive can choose to enter into. I am tired of this. Oh, you've really got me started. I am tired of this blah, blah, blah. Like men are just more risk-taking on average than women, Um, ex with the exception of literal childbirth, which just can, obviously not always. Some people, and I've met them and had lovely conversations with them, find childbirth, you know, an extraordinary and overwhelmingly positive experience. But I never believe him. I'm allowed to say that because I've... Yeah, you've Give, I've given birth twice, so I'm allowed to just blatantly say, don't believe you when you say it was a great experience. I am terrified of, like, I know I can, the pain, it's not even the pain, it's the loss of control. It's loss of control. And also I think I've read too many real, very real, true accounts of women who are treated as the second priority during the childbirth experience and who have their bodies disrespected in ways that to me are very frightening because it's no longer about your well-being it's about like baby comes first and which is an experience that many women have through their entire pregnancy as well yeah I can easily like easily but only imagine that that is definitely the case I think with everything in my life that I've done so far that has been hard my sort of ability to keep myself together and to like control things and to manage and to sort of push through and to choose and have that sort of willpower and sort of force of will has been the thing that I feel has helped me survive through some pretty shit stuff. And the thing I find deeply, deeply unsettling and terrifying is that from my understanding of a lot of what I've read about childbirth, you can't just – like choose to be tough enough. You know, it is a big, it is Absolutely. psychological. It is about whether you're supported. It is about, I get that, all of that. But at the end of the day, there's also this huge component that is just not at all up to you. And that unknown, that known unknown is 
fucking terrifying to me. That's a great answer. That's so interesting. I was not scared of childbirth in the lead up to my first birth. And afterwards it was it took me a long time to – I thought about it every single day after <laughs> for months and months and months. It took me so long to get over it. Not that I had a – particularly like I don't want to scare you or scare any listeners. It's just indescribable. I just can't describe what what it was like. And I everyone ended up fine, but I do remember I had my mum in the room. My mum's a midwife and I felt so safe at all times. I think that's why I wasn't scared actually. I never felt it was hard. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I still sometimes look back and think I can't believe that I did that. But I wasn't scared because I had my mum in the room and I trusted her so much to advocate for me to know when something wasn't going right and to step in which you know you can have the best partner in the world which too bad I do no one else does (laughs) (laughs) we can fight about this later (laughs) but advocating in that medical Mm. setting in something that is so scary for them as well and scary for them Mm. um scarier for the partners I think than they realize walking in so that's why I think yeah I felt super safe because I had her there. So um, if you ever give birth, maybe you can just borrow my mum. She'll, she'll come be your advocate, stand there. Although when I was my first birth, my second birth was a piece of piss compared to my first one, which I think is a common story. But in my first one, there was a point where I gave up pushing, which is a common thing that happens as well. Like basically when you're just about to give birth, there's this really interesting phenomenon of women giving up and being like, I can't do this anymore. And that means the baby's about to come like midwives see that again and again and again anyway I said I started crying and I said I can't do this anymore I can't do it and my mom started crying and turned away from me and she was crying and you know she's a midwife and she's so used to this happening and she couldn't watch me and she said after mom said in that moment all I wanted to do was give birth for you oh my god <laughs> she, yeah she was like I, I couldn't think of anything. Like she couldn't think of her training or, or she had 40 years of experience delivering babies. She was just like seeing her child like that. And now having been it through it myself, I can't imagine watching someone I love go through it, like my sister or something. But the midwife who was incredible when I gave up put my foot on her shoulder and yelled at me, when I say push, you are going to push. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then, <laughs> and then she yelled at me, push, and I got him out, Hamish, and – the midwife said, the midwife was incredible. She stayed with me my whole labor and it was very long labor. And she said afterwards, I don't yell at every woman, but I knew you would respond to it. And she was right. I do really respond to just tell me what to do and yeah. I'll do it. And like be firm and, you know, I'll fall into line, I guess. Little tip for you in the future, if you ever really want me to do something, just yell at me and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> it is an insane experience. Yeah, it sounds fucking unhinged. And for two weeks after every day that we woke up, Matt would look at me every day and say, I can't believe you did that. Like he wow. was like that as well, just completely overwhelmed. Yeah. It's very, it's very animal. Yeah. 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 God damn. Anyway, I'll talk to you more properly about it after you've given birth. Because it's, it's almost yeah. like a club where you, you oh, know, I noticed no so doubt. much that you only talk about it explicitly with other people who have given birth. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I need. Got a- yeah, I don't think I need any more detail at this <laughs> point. In time. For a change of gear, what is your most controversial opinion? Oh my god, I have so many. <laughs> Pick one. My se- my secret takes. What is my most controversial opinion? I told you, it's spicy. That I prefer the men's ashes to the women's ashes. <laughs> Um, cancel. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm honestly thinking of things and thinking that I can't. Okay. My most controversial opinion, actually, I'm going to try and say this in a delicate way. So please don't cancel me. And maybe if I don't land this, you're going to have to tell me and we're just going to have to cut it. Yeah, we can redo. (laughs) My most controversial opinion is that we have, we've come a long way when it comes to recognizing mental health and um, how difficult it can be and being supportive of it. But I feel like we only do it for palatable mental health symptoms and that we're still really bad at looking actual mental illness in the face and what that can look like, particularly when it comes to more extreme illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar, 
psychosis and what people look like when they are in the midst of manic episodes. And I have, you know, a few friends who I've watched go through this stuff many times over the years and it's ugly and people say really terrible, terrible things and they can do really terrible things and it doesn't make them a terrible person. And I think that widely as a society we haven't grappled with that properly and that there's still an impulse to condemn um, really mentally ill behaviour as like an indication of how that person really thinks or feels and we're actually only okay with mental illness that is, you know, someone being sad or anxious or depressed and we're still very uncomfortable when it is scary and offensive. That makes perfect sense. Okay, have I articulated that properly? Yes. Because I feel like that's a difficult opinion to articulate that we, we only, we're only okay with mental illness when it's palatable to us and we don't actually know how to look it properly in the face. I feel like that's one of the arguments that Elfie Scott makes in The One Thing We've Never Spoken About. Oh, is it? Yeah. I've been dying to read that book. Because I think it's – Yeah, I won't say too much because I haven't read it myself, but I think it's her mother who either it was either psychosis or bipolar or one of – Yeah, basically one of the sort of – So she did really shitty things. For want of a better word, more extreme presenting conditions. Yeah, there's just a completely different way that we've come so far accepting and and having – making space for and acknowledging things like anxiety and depression, but not the other ones. Yeah. Yeah because they're more difficult to deal with. I don't think that's that controversial. Uh, Is that are, are we in a bubble where we think the same I, thing no, on I, this? I th- I think no, just look at it, the way that people post and write about it and how they respond to things like Kanye West. Oh, yeah. You know, okay, look I see at the that. Yeah, to yeah. Him. And I obviously condemn yeah, the like hateful things he and has said. And anti-Semitic remarks yes. and everything like that. I condemn all of that. But I think that widely the response to it, like I saw this response that was like I'm mentally ill and I am not anti-Semitic. Um, mental illness doesn't make you anti-Semitic. That's just not true. Like mental illness, it doesn't make you anti-Semitic. Yes, that, that bit is true actually. But mental illness does make you say crazy things yeah. that you don't necessarily believe and makes you buy into really awful conspiracies. And mm. so And so that's when I, when I was watching the response to that, I thought it was so un-nuanced. I thought it, there was a lot of the response to it was people wanting to be seen to say the right thing yes. without actually thinking deeply about what we were being confronted with. I think there's something interesting you mentioned there as well where people are like, uh, oh, that's who that person really is. Yeah. I think our society has an obsession with, quote, unquote, discovering the real someone underneath our facade. It's even in language around, I mean, the last time I encountered that kind of phrasing and that kind of language was um, in the super toxic sort of dieting industry that there can somehow be like a quote unquote real you that's the skinny you under the fat you. And then also that that if it's a celebrity in particular, people love the idea that there's some real Kanye underneath the image Kanye, or there's some real Jennifer Lawrence under the image of Jennifer Lawrence. And I think that if they're if that person does struggle with any kind of sort of psychosis or extreme presenting condition, people just love the idea that they've finally got a peek behind the mask yeah. in some way. And that's just part of this narrative that makes it easier to speak poorly or without the appropriate nuance about whatever they're going through. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. My other controversial opinion is I think men are sooks. Men are so. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. No, well, so it's, is that it's, controversial? It's, is it controversial? No, but I think the narrative, when you said before the narrative about men being more risk-taking when women actually undertake. And it's just not true. Yes, but and also I noticed this. Men cannot handle pain or being yes. sick. And, and we have, I guess, they can be like cliches about man flu and everything. But I noticed it so much around me. Men struggle, cis men, struggle with being sick or in pain and they're like, oh, I feel so terrible and, you know, they go on and on about it. And I think that cis women and trans men and, you know, any non-binary person with a uterus is so used to pain, being uncomfortable because you have to deal with your period every month from when you're a teenager. And so they're used to, you know, imagine if 
someone with our uterus started like bleeding in the middle of a meeting at work or had cramps. There are sometimes when I've had cramps in meetings and I've looked around and been like, if half this room felt like this right now, they would go to hospital. Mm. <laughs> so that's my other sem- semi-controversial opinion that like, in general, women are a lot better at handling pain and discomfort. Pushing and, through and, pain. And we're, and we're framed as, um, you know, weaker or whatever still to a degree and it's just not true. We're like so – we're so much more comfortable, I think, with extreme physical pain and – But we also have studies that show this. Yeah. I, it, oh, look, yes, I'm backed up but my vibes are backed up. Yeah. I love it. My vibes are – yeah. Neither of your opinions – I'm going to say they neither of them are extremely controversial. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you think the first one is it because I feel like I could get my head bitten off if I posted about that on social media. Mm, yeah, I guess. Well, my what about con- you? What's yeah. your controversial opinion? <laughs> I think that all human beings around the world who currently hold any type of royal title should be given a choice between A and B. Choice A is that they willingly divest themselves of that title and all of the benefits that flow from it and volunteer to be exiled from the nation that they were leeching from for life or be guillotine <laughs> as one you, of the most. Kind of, you've got a murderous rage in you, don't of, you? You just yeah. want to kill so <laughs> many people. One of the most humane. Obviously I don't support actual capital punishment in any domestic setting but royals need to be dealt with um and you can't just take their titles away from them and allow them to stay in the countries that they've been leeching from because they'll 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 find a fucking way to to get people on their knees paying money still they need to leave i love this opinion all royalty should be exiled Exiled, basically exiled or executed, and I am benevolent enough to give them the choice. I completely support this. It's so funny talking about the Australian public and people saying, you know, this kooky family has nothing to do with us and it's embarrassing that it's our head of state and therefore Australia should become a republic. And I always and I always think that kooky family has no business in English yeah. politics or in England, like uh, like I always think that step further and be like they should be exiled from England as well. Like England needs to get rid of it. In England, that is such a radical position. I don't I don't feel it so radical in Australia, but in England, it's very radical to think that they should be they should be done with the monarchy. It just offends against what I would have thought by now a very very basic principles of equality and democracy. The idea that there is such a thing still as a birthright for some that everyone else pays for is absurd and it makes me livid. Yeah, but it's also – And I would kill for it. (laughs) And you'd kill them. But it's also kind of great that there's like this one aspect in our society where we don't pretend there's a meritocracy as opposed to so many other parts where we pretend that people are getting their own merit. That is so true. (laughs) Yes, I respect that. At least they're being honest about it to a degree. Yep. Anyway, great opinion. And now we're going to move on to punch in the guts. Yeah. So we wanted to talk to each other about what – You know, like I think we told each other it could be like a book or an article or a movie or an album and we both just picked books, which is – I love it. Yeah. Love that for us. I I did think of one album but I just feel like you can't – Not for Punch in the Guts. And you can't get it across – And yeah, actually the album isn't Punch in the Guts. It's just an album from a very specific time in my life. So I have a very extreme emotional reaction every time I listen to it. But it's boring to discuss an album on a podcast. It's Heathen Chemistry by Oasis because I feel like I'm being annoying not saying what it is. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about Mine it. Mine is the self-titled Orange Bewitched album. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> iconic. Yeah, iconic. I remember dancing to that album in my aunt's apartment in Petersham when we were visiting from Grafton and she'd got it for me as a treat. Iconic. All right, but not our albums are boring. We're not going to talk about them. No. What's your first punch in the gut? I actually had three books, but I thought I only, I got to whittle it down, so I did. Do you have a fiction and a nonfiction? Yes. Okay. Well, let's do let's do fiction. You go fiction. First. Okay. So I this book really cemented for me how much any given book can mean so much more or so much less to you depending on when you arrive at it. 
And I read this book and it's called Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. It's a big, fat, honking, chonky, chonky tonk of a book. I read it on my honeymoon. It was like recommended to me as a sort of beach, like an escapist kind of beach read um, that I could take. And I read it I read it on the second of my two-week honeymoon. And it has a sort of historical narrative and a contemporary narrative. And the historical narrative is this extraordinary, an entire life story, you know, like from even before she was born right up until when she dies of this kind of aviatrix, like sort of reminiscent of Amelia Earhart at the birth time of um, – you know, like solo aeroplane travel. And it tells the story of her basically trying to carve out an independent life for herself. And yes, a part of that is her decision to try to, you know, there's this specific way that no person or no woman had ever kind of circumnavigated the globe, et cetera. And obviously there's a huge overlap there between the idea of um, solo flight as a pilot and just sort of freedom and independence. And then the contemporary plot line, which is much, much smaller, it's not sort of 50-50, but the contemporary plot line is a Hollywood star who is playing that aviatrix in a biopic in set in the modern times. And to me, this book really, it was a punch in the guts because it presented, particularly in the historical narrative track. Her name is Marion Graves, the the pilot. Marion is constantly sacrificing the possibility of commitment and connection in order to gain freedom and independence to the point where, you know, you see what an opportunity she could have had many times throughout her life for a like loving partner and she constantly chooses not like to reject that opportunity in life in order to maintain or reach even further and further and further in this relentless pursuit of independence and freedom. And reading this book, ironically, sort of on my honeymoon, when I had obviously just, I mean, my now husband and I had been together for a decade. So it wasn't like the honeymoon sort of sim- our marriage like symbolized a sense of togetherness that wasn't already there. But it still is ironic, right, reading this book about commitment versus freedom on a honeymoon. And to me it just was – the reason it was a kick in the guts specifically was because it cemented for me a kind of self-knowledge that I had been taking the long way around into achieving, which was that I have this drive in me that I know in myself towards freedom and towards independence and how extraordinarily lucky I am to have found a life partner who knows that about me and respects that about me. And the the minuscule amount of freedom or independence that I sacrifice in order to benefit from love and commitment is just so worth it every single time and I don't know that it would have been possible to have the best of both worlds that I feel I now have in any other generation and it just gave me the most profound sense of gratitude for the specific circumstances I found myself in in my life and also the broader gender geographic, sociopolitical circumstances that I was born into. And I also was reading it when I had the time and space to reflect upon those things. And I just, it has, this book has like profoundly benefited my ability to be grateful for my life and understand who I am in the world and who I want to be and be comfortable and assured in the choices I have made. And I will never, ever forget it and it is my favourite book. I love that. Yeah. And the punch in the guts of it is so easy to take our circumstances for granted and also to think that where we are now equality-wise and, you know, in general as, as a society was always a place where we were going to arrive and forget that it had to actually be fought for mm. very hard. And I think that's very easy to forget in 2023 how hard this fight was and how recent this fight and many ongoing fights actually 
was. And to have a book like that, that is, it's so related to how I feel about the book I chose as well, which is fiction and also something that I read recently and it is so to do with the time in my life. Where you meet the book. You have yeah. to meet a book halfway. Yeah. And it's like, it's like reread, it's, you know, when you reread things like Middle March or, or any book or, you know, other great books and what you think it was about at 20 is completely different to what you think it is about at 30. And the book that I chose is Light Years by James Salter. And if I'd started reading this book when I was 25, I don't think that I would have got more than a chapter in. I, I think I would have found it very boring. I've never even heard of it. What's it about? It's this gorgeous book. It is, and I read it this year as well. And I actually read it, I I wasn't away or anything, but there is certainly something to be said for what you mentioned about having the time and space to read a book. Yes. And this wasn't a book that I was reading, you know, snatching 10 minutes here and there to read. It was a book that I was sitting down with for hours each night. And after I finished it, this is very rare for me, I did not read anything else for a month. Whoa, that's huge Yeah, because I just kept thinking about this book and what I'd taken out of. This book is one of my um, favourite things to read about and a very, very difficult thing to pull off. It is the life of an ordinary family. Wow. And it goes, it's this couple who are together and they're in their 30s and it follows them with their small children, their two daughters, and it follows them and their small children but mostly the couple through essentially to death and nothing super extraordinary happens. They're living their life in the like the late fifties and early sixties. But what James Salter does incredibly, and I think he's actually a real writer's writer is he takes you into their internal life and actually captures it, which is a really difficult thing to do. So he captures what people's actions and how they behave and how other people are perceiving them. But at the same time captures what they're, thinking and how they're feeling about everything, which is a really difficult thing for a writer to pull off. And he just like, he's just an amazing writer. And so he, there's one chapter that I was going to point out where he, it's, we're being more introduced to um, Viri, the husband. Um, so this is like page 34. And he, uh, the, the narrator is, what do you call it? Like third person uh, oh, yeah, omniscient third yeah, person. Yeah, omniscient third yeah. person. So the narrator is – the narrator knows what's going on in everyone's minds basically, but they're not any of the characters. This line, have I said he was a man of minor talent? <laughs> he was born after one war and before another in 1928. In fact, a year of crisis, a year on the path of the century. He was born in disregard of the times, like everyone. The hospital is there no longer. The doctor retired, gone south. Just these little observations about how ordinary we all are and how brief our time is and our universal experience. I think he captures universal experience. He just captures really beautifully what it's like to live a life in the world. And he had this other line. And I think he's quite funny as well, but and I'll just read this other bit. He wanted one thing, the possibility of one thing, to be famous. <laughs> He wanted to be central to the human family. What else is there to long for, to hope? Already he walked modest, modestly along the streets as if certain of what was coming. He had nothing. He had only the carefully laid out luggage of bourgeoisie life, his scalp beginning to show beneath the hair, his immaculate hands and the knowledge. Yes, he had knowledge. But knowledge does not protect one. Life is contemptuous of knowledge. It forces it to sit in the ante rooms, to wait outside. Passion, energy, lies, these are what life admires. Still anything can be endured if all humanity is watching. The martyrs prove it. We live in the attention of others. We turn to it as flowers to the sun. Wow. I, I could keep reading. I'm not going to keep reading, but I have, like, underlined so much of this book. I Like, it's just I mean, beautifully written and beautifully captures, I think, how it is to be a human in the world, even though he's writing about this family in New York at the end of the 50s and early 60s. I dog ear my books and I underline. Do you dog ear and underline your books? Fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I dog ear and underline my books. This book I love so much, I dog eared oh. almost all the way through it and underlined all, all the way through it. And then instead of loaning my copy to everyone, bought my husband his own copy because I didn't want him to read mine and like read my underlinings or mess up my dog ears and then bought copies for two of my really good friends because I don't want to loan this book out and I don't want anyone else to read my copy and I want to keep returning to it. And 
did, did it change my life? It, I don't think that it struck, it kicked me in the guts in the way that it struck me with a huge realisation or made me feel more grateful like it did for you. This book just made me feel really seen and really but to be part seen, of something. Sorry, but to be seen truly, to feel seen is a kick in the guts. Yeah, and to feel part of something and it made me, I found it comforting mm. to and to feel part of something, to feel so ordinary and so small and still to be, you know, living in a life of and life of any scale can be so grand and so interesting and so full of twists and turns. And it's one of those books that makes you uh, acknowledge like how small and insignificant we all are and also how huge we all are and how, a, and how everyone's life can be and is a saga, even if it's just to them and a few people around them. And also he writes really, really beautifully about parenting little children. Mm. And I loved those passages as well. The, like the children grow up over the course of the book, but he captures like the family life of small children really well. Mm. Anyway, beautiful book. Hey, we should say the names again. Mine was Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. And mine was Light Years by James Salter, which was released I think in the early 90s but is not too difficult to hunt down. And I think if you go into any secondhand shop, you'll find a James Salter book mm. basically. But I hadn't heard of him before I read this book. Mm. My nonfiction, it's called Sex and Lies by Leila Slimani, who is a Moroccan French author. And I read this book before going to Morocco and it's it's much more of a kick in the guts in terms of like how other people live like real right now in the world. So it's nonfiction and it's based on a number of interviews that Leila Slimani did with women living in Morocco right now and about how the extremely like hyper conservative and from like a, you know, from the author and from my perspective, regressive sexual politics in that place in terms of specifically hetero and specifically no sex before marriage, like a culture where the mainstream is still obsessed with virginity um, for women only, of course. And this book was just such a punch in the gut because Slimani makes this, you know, she gives people the chance to speak for themselves about what it's really like there. And it has this cumulative effect from the author of showing you how political policy, as in like legislation, things from the government top down, actually just prevent human beings from being able to connect to one each other, one another and live whole good and true lives with each other because the state is so involved in their relationships. And it just, it's incredibly short for the sort of enormity of what it conveys. And I'm just reading from the blurb inside the jacket. In Morocco, the only acceptable sexual activity is between a man and his wife. You know, like all of this, the language of like, who's the object, who's the subject, all of it, where all forms of extramarital sex, homosexuality and prostitution, that's the one thing I also didn't mention, are not only morally frowned upon, but also punishable by law. Women appear to have two options, be a virgin or be a wife. And it's just, it's a kick in the guts. And of course, one of the huge issues with that, of course, it's horrible and oppressive to only get to be a wife and, you know, for prostitution to be banned and all that. But the other thing is you're just never actually going to ban that stuff. So there, yes, there's exactly. always going to be people working as prostitutes. There's always going to be sex outside of yep, marriage. marriage. Yep. And so then th there's the other – those things are still going to happen and mm -hmm. so the other element, the other dreadful element obviously is the punishment that then comes. Banning it's bad enough but then the punishment when people still do it, which they always will. Yeah, and the circumstances that are described in this book of people in neighbourhoods – like telling on each other. Oh my god! Is just for for for. So that's psychologically devastating. Devastating. It's, it's like a like panopticon thing. Yeah. yeah. It, and turning neighbors into cops. Yes. Yeah. 
it just when when we decided that we would talk about things that had kicked us in the guts, boom, that book kicked me in the guts. So my nonfiction is also quite serious and a bit heavy, although maybe a bit more hopeful than yours. Or uh, it is the book that was essentially my political awakening in my Ooh. yeah in my mid twenties. Angela Davis, Women, Race, and Class completely transformed the way I thought about the world and articulated my politics, which had been brewing for many years, but I had never had the words for it. I'd never seen expressed properly. And I came, I guess I like, sometimes I'm a bit embarrassed that I came to it so late. Like I was in my mid twenties, but. Well, I never read it. So. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, my more embarrassed than I am at present. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't mean about not having read it, but I mean having such a big political awakening and realisations sure. I feel came a little bit late. Um, and you, people have obviously their political awakenings in all different ways, not just because of this one book. <laughs> but she, so I grew up, the family I grew up in is like ultra feminist, but they would never, ever use that word. Like I mm. essentially just never, ever heard that word. The way I grew up, here's my normal life, which was like I realised once I left home was quite sheltered in a way because what was normal to me and completely unremarkable was a father who braided the hair of four girls before they went to school, did pick up, did pretty much all of the cooking, uh, made all of our lunches because my mother – worked more shift work. She was a nurse and she worked more shift work. And my father also worked shift work, but, you know, this is the way that it worked out. And it was, as I said, unremarkable. So I grew up in a house where equality between men and women was just absolutely taken for granted by me. And this is like in a country town in northern New South Wales. You know, I, my friends' dads certainly didn't behave this way, but I, because it's my normal, like, you know, when yeah, you're a teenager, that, it's your normal. Everyone does that And you kind of know that some people aren't having the same experience, but it's just so normal to you. So you don't think it's that remarkable. And, you know, my father was like so lovely to so many of my friends who didn't either didn't have, they had absent fathers or just didn't have very good fathers as well. He's just like a very generous, thoughtful man. And so I grew up basically thinking that men are all generous and thoughtful <laughs> and that I and there, I never had a thought in my mind that there was something I couldn't do because I was a woman yeah. or that I there was a specific role that I had to uptake in a house or a home or in the world because I was a woman, which is like so – it's radical in a way. But can I also just say one of the more profound things that our society is proving that it can't grapple with is that there is nothing a man cannot do. Yeah, True. Within the domestic in particular. Yeah, that it seems to, like, we have been saying this rhetoric for multiple decades now that, like, women can do anything, which is true, but what is actually proving to be a sticking point is that men can do anything. Yeah. They just, like, they just and so I And to. so, yeah, I yeah. Grew, and I grew up in a world where, yeah, men can do anything. It was completely yep. unremarkable. You had it both ways. And anyway, and so I came to, like, feminism in my – I went to university. I came to feminism, realised – a lot of things, you know, in being treated as an object and of, to do around how women are allowed to move in the world and should move in the world as opposed to men, blah, blah, blah. Like we all, we all know what that's like. And so that, that was fine. And then I read R Women, Race and Class. And the, inter the way Angela Davis is so freaking smart and so engaging. She was incarcerated. She was in jail in the 70s for a while. She's also an abolition abolitionist, but I didn't really come to that until a few years later, but this book just completely rocked my world and articulated these things, especially around class, that I knew in my gut and I had started to notice going to Bond University, which is a very wealthy university, and I was there on scholarship as one of four children and the child of nurses moving from the country town. You know, I moved to the Gold Coast, paid my own rent from the first week I got there with my job that I had to get and because that's just what I had to do. And I remember at uni not going to the bar and I said to the girls in class, oh, no, I'm not going because I just got my electricity bill. And one of them laughed and said, that's so cute that you pay an electricity bill. <laughs> and, and that's where Rick Morden, um, the writer, and I met and formed an alliance. Anyway, but I'd had this experience and I hadn't – and 
women race and class really articulated the class aspect of that experience and just me I guess the I maybe I, w- I was sheltered in a way but the they all really fell from my eyes in seeing the world for what it was and how unequal it is and also seeing that it's not just about feminism and women's rights but how those oppressions intersect with other oppressions such as race and class and something that I should always be aware of in the way in my politics, the way I move in the world, and also just open my eyes to the way that the world worked. I was completely rocked by the book, and she's such an extraordinary writer. And I also just learned so much about history from the book. Is it very American? Ah, uh, there's a bit of England in there, but it is mostly American. But there is a bit of, but like obviously, like English the examples history. she's giving about policy and stuff, you felt like you could extrapolate those to the Australian. Oh, context. Tar- absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent, yes, you mm. could extrapolate it. It's a very, like, universal book mm. and she's amazing. And so, yeah, that was that was my punch in the guts. Such a waking up to the world, yes, that was women, race and class for me. And I read it after my um, – Tony Abbott became prime minister and my editor at the time, who's an extremely smart woman, Kath Viner, we were talking about what books we want Tony Abbott to read and she said women ra- straight away she's like women race and class by angela davis and i just like wrote it down on my you know how you just yeah. write down books i wrote it down in my notebook and it's so i could have not read this book like i could have so easily not read this book mm. and it's so funny how someone's throwaway comment in a discussion around a news conference can can result in like this complete real uh, like awakening of someone else i, love I don't that. even know if she knows that i read it because of her or that i was so transformed by it but Anyway, that's how I came to it. That's what's Great so good book. about books, though. I know it's like nerdy or whatever to say, but they actually, yeah, they pass between people and change each one yeah. of their lives. And it's not very academic. I don't mind an academic book, but this is so accessible. Like oh, it's really, good. it's not. She's a great, great writer, so it's not too dense at all. Okay, so my pick was for nonfiction was Sex and Lies by Leila Slimani, and my pick was Women, Race, and Class by Angela Davis. Yay. This has been Cool Story with Brie and Bridie. This was a special episode, but of course, normally we talk about our stories, the best stories, and the biggest story of the week. We are produced by Sam Devonport at DM Media. You can also find us on YouTube where you can watch all of our episodes in full. And if you want to send us your thoughts, we are at Cool Story Brie Bridie on Instagram. Want to hear a cool story? Get it wherever you get your podcasts. 